Well, here we go, church. You've read through Ephesians this summer, and here we are. Ephesians chapter 1, as we begin our series of sermons, We the Church, a call to unity. So we will be in the first 14 verses this morning in Ephesians chapter 1. Now, I don't have to tell you that there is no shortage of issues that have the propensity to divide us, right? I mean, you've got doctrinal issues that divide us. We've got social issues, political issues, ethical issues, environmental issues. I mean, you just go down this list. There are untold issues that divide us. But as the church... (laughs) <laughs> there, there's one thing that unites us, the blood of Jesus, that in Christ we are the church. So Paul begins this letter in verse 1, and he identifies himself, which is helpful for us. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, Paul can claim apostleship because he saw the resurrected Christ. You can read about that in Acts chapter 9 when he was converted at on the road to Damascus. But he makes something clear here in Ephesians 1 verse 1. This is by the will of God. This is not by the will of Paul. This is not by the will of man. This is by the will of God. That ultimately, yeah, Paul penned this letter, but ultimately God is the author. And what an author God is. Do you know the book of Ephesians has been called the queen of the epistles? It's been called the grand canyon of Scripture. And no doubt, there's 27 distinct doctrines that are found in this six-chapter letter. It's deep. Paul says, by the will of God. Then he makes this statement, to the saints who are in Ephesus. Now, who are the saints? Well, every believer in every generation is a saint. If you have come to faith in Christ by grace alone, through faith alone, you are a saint. Now hear me well. In no way am I suggesting that you're an angel. (laughs) You're not angels, but you are saints. Amen? In Christ, uh, to the saints who are in Ephesus. So this was a location of people. Now listen, he's writing to the people of God who were in a very pagan city. Ephesus was, was gripped with paganism. On every front. And here's a body of believers that are trying to live out their faith in this pagan place. So these are saints who are in Ephesus. And look what he says. And are faithful in Christ Jesus. So how are we faithful in Christ Jesus? Two ways we're faithful in Christ Jesus. One is that we exercise our faith. We heard the word of truth the gospel of our salvation, and we believed in Him. We put feet to our faith and we believed. We exercised our faith. And then the second way we're faithful is we continue in the faith. We keep the faith, right? So faithful, look at this, in Christ Jesus. Somebody say in Christ. This is Paul's trademark. This is his favorite phrase. He used it 167 times, 164 times in all of his writings. 27 times in Ephesians. And Paul goes on to say this, grace to you in peace in verse 2. Now, grace comes first. Somebody say grace first. Yeah, you can't have peace with God and you can't have the peace of God unless you have grace from God. Grace comes first, then peace. This whole book is set up with two sections. Chapter 1, 2, and 3 is doctrinal. Chapter 4, 5, and 6 is practical. Chapter 1, 2, and 3 is an explanation of our salvation. Chapter 4, 5, and 6 is an application of that salvation, how we live it out. You can think of it in those two. You can even think of it as grace and peace. He says this, grace to you and peace from God our Father, and look at this, and the Lord Jesus Christ. Somebody say Lord. Somebody say Jesus. Somebody say Christ. Lord Jesus Christ. Christ. Lord means master. God is the master. You've been bought at a price, believer. You no longer belong to yourself. You belong to Him. He is Lord and you are not. He is your master. Jesus, the name means Savior. 
Jesus is the only one who saves. He is the Savior. Christ is a title that means Messiah, anointed one, chosen one. The one we've been waiting for. The one the world's been waiting for. To quote the great theologian, Coach Prime, Deion Sanders, prime time. He says, he is him. What a great explanation of Christ. In fact, Peter preaching at Pentecost says, this Jesus whom you crucified, God has made him both Lord and Christ. Lord Jesus Christ. So with that setting, with that greeting, with that beginning, with that introduction that Paul gives us here, then he enters into this explosion of praise from verse 3 to 14. That's going to be our text today in a message entitled, Come on, Church. You know, one of my favorite things to do is worship with you. I, I love hearing you worship. I love joining you in corporate worship. And sometimes I'll get excited and fired up and beside myself and I'll just shout out in the middle of worship, Come on, Church. This is Paul's, from verse 3 to 14, this is Paul shouting, Come on, church. He explodes with adoration, explodes with praise, explodes in worship three different times. You'll find the phrase, To the praise of His glory. Three times in this text. In fact, you can look at it. It begins with, Blessed be the God and Father. An excerpt of worship. It ends in verse 14, To the praise of of his glory. This is a text that highlights that adoration, worship, blessing that is due our God. And so today we're going to focus on verses 3 through verses 14. If you're there, say I'm there. Let's dive in, church. Here we go. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places even as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before Him. In love, He predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of His will, to the praise of His glorious grace with which He has blessed us in the Beloved. In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of His grace which He lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight making known to us the mystery of His will according to His purpose which He set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in Him things in heaven and things on earth. In Him we have obtained an inheritance having been predestined according to the purpose of Him who works all things according to the counsel of His will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of His glory. In Him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in Him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of His glory. Father, to Your glory and honor, may this message be proclaimed and received and responded to in the name of Jesus. We ask it and God's people said. So our takeaway is pretty simple. Get happy in the Lord no matter what happens. We ought to be happy in the Lord no matter what happens. I'm not saying you need to be happy with everything that happens. I'm saying in Christ, believer, you can be happy in the Lord no matter what happens. Paul explodes here. This is an outburst. This is an outflow. This is an overflow of praise. By the way, this is one sentence in the Greek. 257 words. One sentence of explosion explosion of celebration, worship, and praise. Even though he finds himself in a prison, he's able to praise God. He's able to get happy in the Lord no matter what happens. And so he gives us three reasons here how, we, how you and I can get happy in the Lord no matter what happens. And the first one is this. I've worded it this way. God the Father chose us 
to change us. I want you to see this. God the Father, He chose us on purpose to change us for a purpose. God chose us to change us. This is in verse 3, 4, 5, and 6. We have God the Father who has chosen us in order to change us. Every generation is different. Amen? Your generation is not like mine. Mine's not like yours. For example, when I grew up as a kid, we were looking for lightning bugs. We were looking for frogs, tadpoles, uh, four-leaf clovers. My kids, the next generation, they're, they're growing up looking for a Wi-Fi connection. Right? That's just, that's just different. Not, not, not one's not right and one's wrong or one's wrong and one it's just different every generation's different but every generation has this in common we're all looking for something the problem is most of the time we're not really looking for God so praise God that he takes the initiative and he chooses us praise God that he takes the initiative praise God that he in Christ the one who came to seek and save the lost has chosen us and here's how Paul just thinking about this explodes in prayer. Look at verse 3. He can't contain himself. Look at it. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing. I mean, he can't contain himself. And this, this, this front part of this verse, blessed be the God, it, it's blessed be the Lord. This is an old Jewish blessing. You can find this all over the Old Testament. Deuteronomy, 1st, 2nd Chronicles, this idea of blessed be the Lord. And in the Old Testament, the Jewish blessing was for material possessions mostly. They would say, blessed be the Lord for a long life, or blessed be the Lord for abundant crops, or blessed be the Lord for protecting us from our enemies. But Paul takes this old Jewish blessing that was given primarily and exclusively for material blessings, and he flips it on its head. And now he is exclusively using this old Jewish blessing exclusively now to praise God for spiritual blessings, not material blessings. That's a huge shift in the Jewish mindset, in Paul's heart and in his mind. He takes this old Jewish blessing and he flips it on its head. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual. Somebody say spiritual blessing. What's the greatest blessing God's ever given to you? Maybe you say my spouse, my kids, my home, my job, my, my livelihood, my health. And you go on down the list. And those are great blessings. And we better praise God for those blessings. But when you're dead and gone, those aren't going to do you any good. What's your greatest blessing? The greatest blessing available that God makes available unto man is the spiritual blessing of salvation. Being saved is the greatest blessing we could ever experience. It's the greatest blessing available. It's to be saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ Jesus alone. And in this one sentence, Paul explains explodes in praise as this whole section is about our salvation this whole section highlights for us this spiritual blessing of salvation and it does it by the way in a trinitarian way we see the trinitarian nature of our salvation even in verse 3 look at verse 3 again god the father the lord jesus christ and spiritual blessings we see here, if y'all can put verse 3 up here, I want to show you the Trinitarian nature of our salvation. Blessed be the God and Father. Somebody say God the Father. That's the first person of the Trinity. Of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is the second God the Son, right? Who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual, spiritual blessing that alludes to the work of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit and the work of salvation. Salvation is a Trinitarian uh, affair. The triune God is the one who saves us. And when we think of the Trinity, it's good to remember God the Father is God. God the Son is God. God the Spirit is God. And the Father is not the Son. And the Son is not the Spirit. And the Spirit is not the Father. One God, 
three persons. Can we understand this? No. <laughs> do we have to? No. All you have to do is stand under it by faith. For this is the greatest blessing. The Trinity working in and through our salvation to save us. God the Father, the architect of salvation. God the Son, the accomplisher of salvation. The one who achieves salvation. God the Holy Spirit is the one who applies our salvation. God the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. And look at this, where Paul's focus is in verse 3. Look at it. With every spiritual blessing in the what, church? In the heavenly places. Somebody say heaven. Paul wrote with heaven in mind. You read Paul's letters. He is focused on heaven. He has a view of heaven. In chapter 1, he talks about the heavenly places. We just read it. Chapter 2, he talks about the heavenly places. Chapter 3 in Ephesians, he talks about the heavenly places. Chapter 6, he talks about the heavenly places. In Philippians, he says, heaven is far better. He says, our citizenship is in heaven. And from it, we await a Savior who will take these lowly bodies and transform them into glorious bodies. Paul had his heart and mind and eye set on heaven. It is undeniable to read Paul's writings and not think of heaven. You see it all over his writings. The fact that Paul had an emphasis on heaven is as undeniable as the fact that a Tupperware lid, I'm convinced, would be the greatest murder weapon ever because nobody could ever find it. Right? And Paul's writings are as undeniable in that his focus is on heaven all over the place. And we are celebrating and we're praising God with Paul in verse 3. And we're praising God and we're celebrating for all the blessings and every spiritual blessing under heaven, in the heavenly places. And then we get to verse 4 and we shut down. Baptists get a little nervous when we get to verse 4. We tense up, right? We get, hey, I don't, I don't know about this. Verse 4, Ephesians 1, even as he chose us in him even as He selected us, even as He elected us, even as He picked us out for Himself. That, that kind of, ooh, wait a minute now. I don't know about that. Even as He chose us in Him. This is called the doctrine of election, and yes, it is a biblical doctrine. And so there's two extremes that are very dangerous when it comes to this Doctrine of election. One extreme is, let's just eliminate election. We cannot eliminate election. We can't eliminate it because we're afraid of it, or because we don't understand it, or because we can't explain it, or because it makes us tense up, or you know, it, it's concerning to us. We, we can't rewrite the Bible to take out what we don't think is right. We can't do that. This is a biblical doctrine. And as you read, Paul is exploding in praise over this. Not fear. Not worry. He's praising God over this. The other extreme is what we might call hyper-Calvinism. Hyper-Calvinist is one that would believe that God picked those who were going to heaven. He picked those who were going to hell. And man has no responsibility whatsoever in that uh, that mystery of God's sovereignty and man's responsibility, they just remove man's responsibility altogether. They say that man has no opportunity. Free will is totally rejected. I think about William Carey, the 18th century, the father of modern missions. And William Carey went to some pastors at that time begging them, send missionaries to the nations. Send missionaries to the world with the gospel. And one preacher stood up and looked at William Carey and said, young man, sit down. When God gets ready to save the heathen, he'll do it, and he doesn't need anybody's help to do it. That would be probably the thought of a hyper-Calvinist. I sent you a text this week, and the text was, you choose, does God choose us, or do we choose God? That really wasn't a fair question on my part. <laughs> uh, Elise Showalter, she sent back, she said, well, did you choose Tanya, or did Tanya choose you? <laughs> well, of course... Well, Tanya chose me, right? Of course. Of course, right? So this choosing, I know it can make us a little uneasy, but the picture that we see here 
in a text like this is God's choosing us and our freedom so that we can turn around and choose his choosing. This thing about God choosing, this isn't anything new. God is... God chose to create the world. He he chose Abram to be a blessing to the nation. He chose the nation of Israel to be a light to the the Gentiles. He he chose, Jesus chose the twelve. God chose both Jew and Greek to be saved. This, This isn't anything new that God's sovereignty and choosing and electing and selecting. But there's also this aspect of man's responsibility. And we even see man's responsibility in this sentence. In this very 257 word sentence. We see down in verse 13, man's responsibility. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him. So the answer to the question, does God choose us or do we choose God, is yes, it's both. Somehow in this mystery of of, of, of salvation it's both Spurgeon was asked the question how do you reconcile God's sovereignty and man's responsibility and Spurgeon responded quote I don't reconcile two friends he went on to say if I find taught in scripture that man is responsible for all his actions it's true if I also find in another place in scripture that everything is foreordained then that is also true two truths cannot be contradictory to one another There are two lines that are so parallel with each other that the mind that shall pursue them the farthest will never discover that they converge, but they do converge, and they will meet somewhere in eternity close to God's throne. Adrian Rogers said, when I get to heaven and I see the gate, I imagine there'll be a sign over the gate that says, whosoever will may come. And when I cross through, I'll turn around and look at the back of that sign. It'll say, elect before the foundation of the world. Another pastor was asked about this problem, the problem of God's sovereignty and man's responsibility. And the pastor said, that's not my problem. That's God's problem. And to him, it's no problem. Another pastor said, come to Jesus, and when you come, thank him for drawing you. Warren Wiersbe said, try and explain election away, you'll lose your mind. Or try to explain election, you'll lose your mind. Try to explain it away and you'll lose your soul. Well, pastor, I don't understand it. Well, guess what? I don't understand it either. But here's what God tells us in Isaiah. For my thoughts are higher than your thoughts, and my ways are higher than your ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my thoughts higher than your thoughts. Amen? So here's what we don't... We don't have to be afraid of election. We don't have to be scared of it. We don't have to be spooked by it. We don't have to be nervous about it. We don't have to worry about it. Because it says that God took the initiative and He chose us. What an incredible blessing this is. In the spiritual realm, God saves us from Himself, for Himself, to Himself. He saves us by grace, through faith, in Christ alone. Look what it says in verse number 4. Even as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world. Look at this. Even as He chose us in him in Christ when before the foundation of the world this phrase right here before the foundation of the world this phrase is in here for your benefit and for my benefit that's not in there for God God's timetable and our timetable is different does anybody know that can I get a testimony anybody in here says God's not working off my timetable anybody yeah God's on a whole different timetable So this foundation of the world before it, that's for us, that's not for God. See, God doesn't operate the way we operate. We operate in past, present, future. I was, I am, I will be. God don't operate that way. God operates in the eternal present. He is ever present. He is always present. He is eternal present. He is the I am who I am. Jesus said before Abraham was, I am. He didn't say before Abraham was, I was. He said before Abraham was, I am. So he's operating on a completely different timetable than we are. And before the foundation of the world, this is for us. And this tells you, and this tells me, that before you were even created, before creation, God chose you for salvation. Now at some point in time, that's going to get down deep in your soul. And you're going to have to shout. Because before creation, you were chosen for salvation. And He chose you in order to change you. We see this here. That we should be holy and blameless. 
This is a picture of Old Testament where people would bring their sacrifice to the altar unblemished. This is a picture of what this is. That in Christ, when God looks at us, He sees us as set apart and blameless. And we are holy and blameless before Him, before the Lord. He has chosen us for one reason, church, to change us. In fact, Spurgeon said, if God had not chosen me before the foundation of the world, He wouldn't choose me now. You were chosen way back then to be holy and to be blameless. Verse number 5, in love he predestined us. Look at this, in love. You saw that at the, at the bottom of verse 4 actually because verse 5 really begins right here. So, But in love he predestined us. Not in hate. We, we think of election, and pre, we think of it in the negative. It's not negative. It's not in hate he chose us, but in love he chose us. He predestined us for what? For adoption. Somebody say adoption. What does it mean to be adopted? You know what it means to be adopted? You're a child of God. You've been adopted into the family of God. You now have every right and every privilege of any other child of God. You now have in Christ every right and every privilege as Christ himself. You can cry out, Abba, Father. You are a child of God. I am convinced, church, that our greatest apologetic the greatest way we can ever defend our faith, the greatest way we can ever defend our faith in Christ, our greatest apologetic for the faith is that we have been adopted into the family of God. We adopted John. John now has every right and privilege that Brady and Bell has. He's been adopted. He belongs to us. In Christ, you've been adopted. You belong to the Lord, to the creator of heaven and earth. You don't think this is a spiritual blessing? What, are you kidding me? That he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through what? Again, through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will. And, and look what it says a little further down in verse 6. Go to verse 6. It tells us real clearly here according to the purpose of his will, look at this, to the praise of his glorious grace, there's that phrase again, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. He has chosen us to change us in the beloved. Who is that? In Christ. See, I'm not a five-point Calvinist. I'm not a five-point Arminianist. I don't even think that's a word. I'm an all-points Biblicist who's been called to point people to Jesus by doing the work of an evangelist. And the doctrine of election should not frighten us. The election does not eliminate evangelism. It elevates evangelism. Because now we have a purpose. We know some will be saved. We're not just out there doing this in hopes that, man, I hope somebody... We know that some people, when they hear the truth, the gospel of their salvation, they will believe in Him. And 257 words, Paul writes, in an explosion of praise. He is not only embracing election, he is celebrating it. Do you know this is almost as long as the Gettysburg Address? One sentence? He's praising the living God. He can say to you and to me, we can get happy in the Lord no matter what happens. Why? Because God chose us to change us. You ever remember playing a pickup game of basketball, baseball, football when you were young and you have two captains and the two captains are selecting players? You remember that? And do you remember when your name was called and how excited you got when they picked you? Hey, God has called your name and now you call upon him to be saved and call out his name. For he has called yours. Hey, we can get happy in the Lord. Why? Because God chose us to change us. So we better get to adoring the God who adopted us as sons. We better get to blessing the God who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Get to cheering the God who chose us in him before the foundation of the world. Get elated about election. And let's praise God about it. Here's the second reason that we can, no matter what happens, 
get happy in the Lord. Number two, God the Son saved us to send us. This is in verse 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, and 12, okay? And here we see the Son saved us to send us. You ever feel like you're so tired? I mean, some of us are walking around. We're so sick and tired of sin. We're walking around and our, our check sin engine light is on. But we're just, we just keep driving like, ah, oh, it'll be all right. Right? If salvation was up to you and salvation was up to me, nobody would ever be saved. God takes the initiative. He chooses us, but something has to happen, and that something is found in Christ. And here we have it in verse 7 through verse 12. Look what the Bible says. In Him we have redemption. I want you to look at this in verse 7. In Him we have redemption. Somebody say redemption. This is a compound word in the Greek, okay? Part of the word in the Greek is a preposition, and part of it is a verb. Part of it is away from, a preposition, and the other is a verb to loosen or to release. Right? God has released us from slavery. He's released us from spiritual bondage in Christ. We have been released. We have been loosed. We have redemption. This doesn't mean that, man, I hope one day I'll have redemption. Or, man, I'm praying for redemption. Or, I'm looking forward to redemption. Or, man, I wish I could earn that redemption. It's not we hope one day to have redemption. We have redemption. We have it right now in Christ. It's ours. And we have it through His blood. This is Calvary's cross. That tree where Jesus, he bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and, and, and live to righteousness. That This is his blood that he shed for you and for me. And in that, through that rather, we have redemption. What does that mean? What have been, we, we have forgiveness of our trespasses. Our sin has separated us from God. So God sent his son to die on the cross, to forgive our sin. Forgiveness of our sins. The greatest blessing in all the world is the fact that you and I have been forgiven. I think about the Mark chapter 2. I think about this crippled man where his friends are lowering him through the roof to Jesus. And Jesus says something fascinating to this guy. He tells him ultimately, your sins are forgiven. What does that have to do with him being crippled? Well, Jesus is saying, hey, the greatest blessing I can give to you is to forgive your sin. That's the greatest blessing I can give to you is to forgive your sin. And then it's a process as we live for the Lord to be forgiven. Uh, if we confess our sins, he is just, he is faithful to forgive us our sins if we confess those sins. How does this happen? How are we forgiven of our trespasses? According to what? According to my good works? According to my good deeds? According to uh, the fact that I deserve it? Or according to human achievement? No, no, no. According to the riches of His what? Here's, the great, here, here's, here's, here's a great definition of grace. It's a simple definition Man, it's, it's a good one. You might want to write this down. Grace. What is the riches of His grace? Grace is God treating you like you never sinned. That's grace. He treats you like you never sinned. According to God treating you like you've never sinned, you're forgiven of your sins. What? Isn't that amazing? According to the riches of His grace. He talks about His glorious grace. You know, it's time for us to stop dumbing down God's amazing grace. Isn't it? Isn't it time to start treating God's amazing grace as amazing and stop treating it as man's amusing works? God's grace is not man's amusing works. God's grace is His amazing grace. And look, He doesn't just forgive us. He gives us the ability to know His plan. He wants you to know His will. He wants you to know His word. He says that down in verse 10 as a plan for the fullness of time. He's going to make known to you the mystery of His will according to His purpose. As a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in Him, things in heaven and things on earth. God not only has a plan, He's carrying out His plan. That good work that He began in you, He'll bring it to completion for this God. 
has works that he has prepared beforehand in Christ that you should walk in them. He forgives us and then he gives us the ability to do that. And look at verse 11. In him we've obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. Look at this. So that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. The first to hope in Christ. There's more who are going to hope in Christ. God, the overseer of our souls, has saved us and sent us because there's more souls to oversee. So the gospel of Jesus, it came to you because it's on its way to somebody else. So don't hoard the gospel, don't hog the gospel, don't hide the gospel. Proclaim the gospel. Let it be known. Let it not be lost on us that the lost can be saved. That God has chosen them for salvation. He desires no one to perish, but that all should come to repentance. God the Son saves us to send us. Here's the third reason why we've got to get happy in the Lord no matter what happens. Number three, God the Spirit informs us in order to transform us. God the Spirit, He informs us in order to transform us. Without the work of the Holy Spirit, you cannot be saved. You will not be saved apart from the work of the Holy Spirit. This is a truth that we find in verse 13 and verse 14 in Ephesians chapter 1. Look at verse 13. This is so good. Verse 13, in him, you. Somebody say you. All up until this point, it's been we, 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 we. It gets here now, in him, you also. Oh, wow. We're included, man. Not only just for Jew, but Greek also. Gentiles also. You and me also. In him, you also. They were the first to hope in Christ. Christ came first for the Jew and then for the Gentile. But now, in him, you also. When you heard the word of truth, praise God that you've heard the word of truth. Praise God the Holy Spirit has opened your eyes and let you hear the word of truth and has revealed himself to you. You know there's people around the world who have yet to hear the truth. Do you know this? There are people all over the world that have never heard the truth. So Paul is so excited that not only has he heard the truth, but now he knows that others, you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel, the good news of your salvation, and believed in him. Here's your responsibility. Believed in him. When you've heard the gospel, what is the gospel, the good news? The gospel is Jesus Christ, perfect in every way. God's only son came to this earth, lived a perfect life, perfect in every way. Went to the cross, sacrificially, willingly, substitutionary. He goes to the cross, to pay the penalty not of his sin, but your sin and my sin. And the Bible says that the gospel, according to the scriptures, that Jesus died according to the scriptures, that he was buried according to the scriptures. He was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. He died for you instead of you and in your place and was buried. And on the third day he was raised from the dead. Proof that he alone has authority on earth to forgive our sin. This is the gospel and you've heard the truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him. So now the gospel says not only must you hear, you must believe. You must hear, you must trust. You must hear, you must turn from your sin, repent, and believe the gospel. So today the Holy Spirit is drawing you. What you're feeling right now is the drawing of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit allowed you to hear the truth. I urge you to understand the gospel and drew you to believe in Him. And when you do that, when you believe in Him, in that moment, not, not ten minutes later, not the next day, not after you get baptized, not after you join the church, but in that very moment, when you believe in Him, you were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. When you're saved, you get all of the Holy Spirit. You don't get some of him later. The question is not, do you have all the Holy Spirit? The question is, how much of you does the Holy Spirit have? You got all of them at salvation. And you're sealed. You are sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. And I don't know if you know this about the first century, but seals were important. A seal communicated ownership. 
A seal communicated, oh, I love this one. A seal communicated that this package or letter or whatever seal, it is guaranteed, listen to this, guaranteed to arrive at its destination. I know you can't believe that in the world we live in today. But it was guaranteed it's going to get, you know what that means? Hey, hey, believer, in Christ, because of the sealing of the Holy Spirit, you are guaranteed to get to heaven one day. Yes, you, hey, give him praise. Come on, yes. You are guaranteed to get to heaven one day because you're sealed by the Holy Spirit. And, and this is what it says. I'm, I'm, you can see this as well as I can. Look at verse 14. Sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. Look at this. Who is the guarantee? I told you, you're guaranteed to get there. It's a guarantee of your inheritance, okay? <laughs> so it's guaranteed you're going to get there until you acquire possession of it to the praise of His glory. Do you see why Paul's so excited? Do you see why Paul can look at this and say, oh my, man, I can, I can get happy in the Lord no matter what happens? Well, you can too because of the grace and mercy of God Almighty. We need to make much of our Maker who's making all things new. We need to... Uh, to praise Him who predestines. We need to rejoice in Him who redeems. We need to salute the God who saves. We need to take pleasure in the God who takes away our sin. Get happy in the Lord. No matter what happens, Dr. E.V. Hill was preaching a sermon. I want to read an excerpt from his sermon as a conclusion. Here he goes. God wasn't at His best when He created the heavens and the earth. He was not at his best when he made man. God was not at his best when he called the Red Sea to separate. God was not at his best when he sent manna from on high. God was not at his best at the virgin birth. God was not at his best in the miracles of the resurrection of the dead. God was at his best nearly 51 years ago with a little country boy whose mother couldn't make enough money to feed him and who some people in the country helped raise. At 11 years old, walking down Grandma Jody's lane, this great big old God came all the way down and got right into the soul, into the spirit, into the head, into the heart of this little 11-year-old boy. I didn't know what was happening to me. I got home. I said, Mama, I don't know what's happening to me. And I explained what happened. She said, Son, boy, I think God saved you. That is God at His best when He saved me. When He, the great God of the universe, came all the way down and got into the heart and spirit of that little 11-year-old boy. Every time He saves a lost soul, that's God at His best. Not the moon, not the stars, not the hills, not the mountains, not the valleys, not the trees, not the rivers, lakes, or oceans, but God picking up a drunkard and making him a preacher. God picking up a, a, a prostitute and making her a singer. God picking up people down and out and putting them on their feet. Causing us to stand and say, glory, he saved me. I'm saved. That's God, the Savior, at his best. I'm but a wretch. It took a miracle to put the moon in space. It took a miracle to put the sun in place. But when he saved my soul, cleansed me and made me whole, that was God at his best. Amen? Would you stand with me, Father? We praise you in the name of Jesus. We ask, Lord, that you have your way in our hearts and in this place. God, that right now, Holy Spirit, you'd come down. This big old great God would come down into the heart of this student, into this boy, into this girl, into this man, into this woman, and stir their heart and awaken them from their spiritual uh, death and awaken them to the truth of the gospel. And they would hear you, Lord, call their name. And they in turn would call on you to be saved. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I don't pretend to assume that there are people in here that everybody in this place is saved. I don't, I don't, I don't believe that for one minute. There are lost people in this room. There are lost people worshiping with us online. And Jesus, the Lord Jesus, has done everything possible to save them. And Holy Spirit, you're drawing them right now. So where they are, I ask, they just make a little altar right there with their heads bowed, eyes closed, and just pray, Father, I know I'm a sinner. I know I've been separated from you due to my sin. But I believe Jesus is the Son of God. I believe that he died for me and was raised from the dead. And today I'm asking you to forgive me of my sin. God, you're right, I'm wrong. Forgive me and save me today. Oh God, would you save them? 
Father, maybe there's some that done that, but they've not made it, made it known that they're saved. Maybe they were saved a year ago, 10 years ago, last year. They've never been baptized. I pray that they'll come this morning and present themselves, say, hey, I'm ready to be baptized. Maybe they want to join the church. Maybe they need prayer down front here at these steps. And our pastors will be down front, and we ask you, Lord, to move in only the way that you can in this place. As people respond to you in Jesus' name, and God's people said, I'm going to go get ready for baptism. You are going to come to the Lord. You make your way down front. Let us know the decisions you've made this morning as you come. Bill will be down front. You come as the Lord leads you. Let's worship, church.